In the first hour, we have class at 10 o'clock, and this is our second session on Sunday morning. We are doing a new study in the Epistle to the Ephesians, so you can get your Bible out and get ready for that, if you will. Remember, uh, this is the Grace and Truth Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. If you're in the Vancouver, Portland area, you can drop by or give us a call. We have class on Sunday at 10 o'clock, now again at 1115. And after our second service, we have time to sing the great hymns of the church. On Thursday, we have class at 7 o'clock, and we're studying the book of Ephesians there. And on Wednesday, my wife has a class for the ladies at 2 o'clock Wednesday. They're currently going through an overview of the whole Bible. What a study that is. So uh, if you're a, a lady, you can join with her at that time, 2 o'clock, right here at our house. Remember at Grace and Truth Bible Church, we teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. So if you're interested in serious, in-depth Bible teaching from the original languages, verse by verse, category by category, you are at the right place at the right time. Welcome aboard. Welcome to all of our remote viewers from all over the country and around the world. Good morning, Pastor Bamuleka over there in Uganda, Atlanta Christian Church, and over in Ireland, Tip. How you doing, Tip Killingsworth? Uh, so we got a lot of friends in various places, and uh, I didn't, I can't mention everybody, but we have a lot of people out there that are viewing. I'm honored that you consider your time uh, worth listening uh, and uh, part of this local congregation, even though we are far from being local in this day and time. Thank mm -hmm. you for the technology, Lord, to do these things. Um, let's see. These covered everything. I think that, oh, I had one other announcement. Oh, here it is. I mentioned in the first hour, those that may not have been with me, uh, we received a an order or a, a bunch of books, the uh, God's Powerful Promises. These are by uh, Dr. Robbie Dean in uh, Houston, Texas, great teacher of the Word of God, a colleague of mine, and he's put together this book of promises. I don't think it has all 7,000 promises, but it has quite a few wonderful promises for us as believers. It also has a clear gospel presentation, so you can use it for unbelievers or just put it in your pocket and when you're getting a haircut or uh well, maybe not stop to the light because you'll get too engrossed. <laughs> but, you know, when you're doing those things that are taking your time and you can uh, just pull it out of your pocket and go through, through some of the promises that God has given. So uh, this is a great little epistle, a little missile that you can use for your personal study or give it away to another believer or to someone who uh, you want to give the gospel presentation. John 3.16 and other great passages are in there. <clears throat> It is our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our Bible studies, as you know. For silent prayer, we believe this is necessary throughout the day to keep short accounts with God and any sins that we've committed to acknowledge them. The Holy Spirit's ministry in one case is to cause us to recognize personal sin, to convict us, even as believers, so that we can acknowledge those sins. 1 John 1, 9 is quite clear. It says, if we, believers, confess our sins, that is, to name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins. He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That picks up the ones that we uh, name. It also picks up the ones we forgot or didn't know that we had committed. And we believe that's the mechanism whereby we reinstate the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit who permanently indwells us. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study in this second hour, let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful for another opportunity to study your word, to advance from grace to grace spiritually by taking in principles of Bible doctrine. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us as members of your royal family, those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atoning death 
on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for all of these things, these unspeakable gifts. Nevertheless, we pray that you would edify our souls now, challenge and motivate us by the things we study, and we'll pray it all in the powerful and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is written, and man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly <clears throat> dividing the word of truth. Open the word this morning in the second hour to the epistle to the Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. But if you were with us in the first hour, we took some time, since this, of course, is Memorial Day, and Memorial Day is dedicated to those who have given their lives for their country, or certainly that are now with the Lord, uh, having passed in uh, past time, and nevertheless, we uh, remember them. There are three days that we have during the year for commemoration. One, of course, now Memorial Day. Another is Veterans Day, which looks at all the veterans who are serving now and in the past, uh, their country. And then there's Flag Day, which recognizes the greatness of our nation. And so we have these days. But on each of these days, I've taken it upon myself to examine uh, some of the great uh, individuals in the military services of our country who have in some cases given their lives for their country or certainly given tremendous service and honored themselves extremely well. Uh, there are 11 different awards given to members of the military in this country and over the uh, many years uh, they have been added. We think of the Purple Heart for being wounded and stuff like and uh, awards like that. But the highest decoration in our land is the Medal of Honor. And of course, that was instituted early about 1861 for the Navy and the Marines. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, for in 1962, just a year later, they added the Army and the Air Force. These are those who have given their lives in many cases, certainly done uh, excellent uh, work in the military, in combat situations, as they say in the uh, uh, listing, above and beyond the call of duty, they have done great things. And years ago, when I studied under Pastor R.B. Thiem in Houston, Texas, one of the things that he did on these various holidays was to read citations of the great military personnel who in many cases had given their lives or otherwise had served above and beyond the call of duty and to acknowledge them. It's one thing to simply uh, salute or to even recognize someone who's wearing a hat such as I do uh, as a veteran and recognize the service that we have offered at some time in our past life. Nevertheless, it's something else to go back and actually look at some of the citations of these noble individuals who have honored themselves by their incredible bravery in the face of uh, and many times uh, innumerable uh, odds and, of course, have done a great job. So I wanted to continue that tradition. I had two in the first hour. I'm going to look at two in this second hour as well. So I'm looking, of course, in the Medal of Honor citation uh, book. And this was, of course, produced by the government. And there are others with regard to the more recent combat situations, Afghanistan and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Korean War and so forth. But uh, the ones that are listed here uh, go back quite a bit. And I think since I'm a, <laughs> a senior citizen, I go back to the time of the Vietnam era and also to my Father's Day uh, War II. And so looking at several of these, this is a fellow named Joe Paul. Joe Paul, who is listed, and uh, he's a Lance Corporal. And I mentioned in the first hour, if you were here, uh, that uh, I like to look at kind of the grunt soldier, if you will. Uh, many of these individuals that won the Medal of Honor were captains and colonels and uh, sergeants and sergeant majors. But I like to give the citations of those who, in many cases, were drafted into the military and uh, didn't make it a career. And yet they came under fire and were in combat and did incredible acts of bravery. Well, here we have a Lance Corporal, United States Marine Corps, Company uh, H, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 2nd Marine Division. And it says that this was in Chu Lai, a Republic of Vietnam, in uh, um, 1965. I was in the 
Army from 64 to 66. So this is during my tenure in the uh, Army during the Vietnam era. I did not go over to Vietnam. I uh, left the service in 66 just before it got really bad. And a matter of fact, about one day before they held everybody over, I was that close to going over. So the Lord spared me, but many of my comrades and colleagues, of course, went and uh, obviously many of them uh, are on that wall that we find in Washington, D.C. 19, and this is, of course, uh, uh, it says that he was from Dayton, Ohio, uh, uh, and that's where he entered the service, but he was from Williamsburg, Kentucky. This is a southern boy here. Then he moved up north. His citation reads for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in violent combat. Corporal Paul's platoon sustained five casualties as it was temporarily pinned down by devastating mortar, uh, recoilless rifle, automatic weapons, and rifle fire delivered by insurgent communist Viet Cong forces in well-entrenched positions. The wounded Marines were unable to move from their perilously exposed positions forward uh, of the remainder of their platoon and were suddenly subjected to a barrage of white phosphorus rifle grenades. That stuff is incredibly painful and uh, devastating in every way. Corporal Paul, fully aware of his, uh, of his tactics that it would uh, almost certainly result in serious injury and even death to himself, chose to disregard his own safety and boldly dashed across the fire-swept rice paddies placing himself between his wounded comrades and the enemy and delivered effective suppressive fire with his automatic weapon in order to divert the attack long enough to allow the casualties to be evacuated. Although critically wounded at this point during the course of the battle, he resolutely remained in his exposed position, continuing to fire his rifle until he collapsed and was evacuated by his fortitude and gallant spirit self-sacrifice in the face of almost certain death, he saved the lives of several of his fellow Marines. His heroic action served to inspire all who observed him and reflect the highest credit upon himself, the Marine Corps, the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life in the cause of freedom. So one of these that we've had several this morning that managed to get uh, back to safety and uh, recover from their serious wounds he apparently did not. The other citation is an individual named William R. Prom. Prom, just like where you went on your senior year in high school. His name was William Prom. He also is a Lance Corporal, United States Marine Corps, uh, Company I. Sounds like the same outfit, huh? Marines, uh, 3rd Marine Division. And uh, this was near An Haas. Republic of Vietnam in 1969. The other fellow was 1965. This is uh, uh, four years later. He entered service at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, his birth was in, uh, let's see, it says here, was that his birth, the date of interest? Yeah, he entered the service in Pittsburgh. That's where he was born. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a machine gun squad leader <clears throat> with Company I, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, 3rd Marine Division in action against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam while returning from a reconnaissance operation on February 9th, 1969 during Operation Taylor Common, if you were there or remember that time, that particular action. Two platoons of Company I came under intense automatic weapon fire and grenade attack from a well-concealed North Viet Cong Army force in fortified positions. The leading element of the platoon was, platoon was isolated and several Marines were wounded. Lance Corporal Prom immediately assumed control of one of the machine guns and began to deliver returning fire. Disregarding his own safety, he advanced to a position from which he could more effectively deliver covering fire while first aid was administered to the wounded men. 
realizing that the enemy would have to be destroyed before the injured Marines could be evacuated, Lance Corporal Prom again moved forward and delivered a heavy volume of fire with such accuracy that he was instrumental in routing the enemy, thus permitting his men to regroup and to resume their march. Shortly thereafter, the platoon again came under heavy fire, in which one man was critically wounded. Resulting instant, um, I'm sorry, reacting instantly, Lance Corporal Prom moved forward to protect his injured comrade. Unable to continue his own fire because of severe wounds, he continued to advance to within a few yards of the enemy position. Therefore, standing in full view of the enemy, he accurately directed the fire of his support element. He was calling fire down on his position, if you can imagine, right on his own position. Uh, and it says uh, that, uh, let's see, he was mortally wounded, I hope not by his own uh, soldiers, but inspired by his heroic action, the Marines launched an assault that destroyed the enemy. Lance Corporal Prom's uh, indomitable courage, inspiring initiative, and self selfless devotion to duty upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Now, this, to me, is what Memorial Day is all about. It's one thing to recognize and to thank people for their service. It's quite another thing to actually remember individuals. There are hundreds and thousands of individuals in all of the services through all the wars of this country, and they have been the reason that you and I sit here and have freedom today. Hopefully, if the situation ever results that we need to be such a warrior for our nation, we will be like these and do what the Lord desires for us to do. Well, hopefully you are now in the New Testament, in the epistle to the Philippians. <coughs> for those who have been with us last week and this first hour of this morning, we looked at the introduction. We have material uh, on the table for the introduction and the outline of the uh, epistle to the Philippians by Paul. For those who have been with us, we just completed a study of the book of Hebrews, and we noted that chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews is all about application in the Christian life, some 22 principles of application. As it turns out, Paul wrote to the Philippian church, as we mentioned in the introduction, uh, who supported him financially throughout most of his ministry, more than any other church, multiple times, and he is thanking them in this epistle, but more than that, he is encouraged by the fact that they have been faithful to the word of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were one of the most positive churches in the first century faithful to the Lord, as well as supporting the ministry of Paul and apparently others as well. So we have him writing to, to them to thank them, but his desire was to give principles of application to live the Christian life. And so he does that. Uh, there's very little negative uh, information, except to be aware of those who were antinomian, we said in the first hour, and that simply means the lawless, violent people, just as those we have today, who think they will solve something by going to the streets and being violent. Uh, that never accomplishes anything. The only violence that is needed is when you're defending your freedom and your nation from aggression, and you do not go and become violent against the citizens of your own country and against the laws and the justice of your own country, even though you may in times disagree with it, it is the law of the land until it is legislatively and judicially changed to the correct interpretation of laws. Well, that's a study for another time. At any rate, in our outline, we're in the introduction uh, as well. And the first verse is where we started. And this is the praise that Paul is giving in this section uh, for the saints in Philippi. And then he follows it up in verse 9 by a prayer for them. And then he speaks of his own personal circumstances, giving a testimony. And then begins in chapter 1, verse 27, the exhortation to encourage them to live appropriately what we call the Christian life. We got through the first two words, or at least the first word, we examine Paul in the introduction, and we have another individual mentioned here, Timothy. It's interesting, we have uh, six different epistles where apparently Timothy was with Paul. 
he was a pastor in training, as you know, along with Titus. And of course, uh, Titus traveled with Paul. Timothy probably traveled the most, these six different epistles where he is with Paul, apparently in this uh, tri trip to uh, Philippi, coming from Asia Minor, they left Troas, where Timothy apparently got saved and then became one of Paul's closest confidants and a pastor in training and eventually uh, fulfilled that ministry as Paul wrote two epistles, what we call pastoral epistles, to instruct Pastor Timothy into uh, specific details of the ministry of a local church. So we have Paul, and we noted the fact that Paul is mentioned in chapter 7 through 13 as, as Saul. Then his name was changed, and uh, from there on, uh, let's see, uh, in chapter 13 through 28, another 16 chapters where his name was changed to Paul, Paul meaning the little one. Uh, he didn't like Saul. He wanted to have a, uh, a name of a diminutive stature indicating not only that he was physically a short person, but small in terms of the fact that uh, he didn't consider himself important, although he wrote the great percentage, 13 epistles in the New Testament. Altogether, in the book of Acts, there are 22 chapters about the life and ministry of the great apostle Paul. Uh, and uh, so those, of course, are parallel with all of the 13 epistles that he wrote at various times. Uh, one time, of course, uh, most of them written from Roman imprisonment, first and second imprisonment. Others, of course, written as well. The so-called prison epistles, as we noted, were four. They were uh, the epistle to the Ephesians, which, we have stud which we're studying now on Thursday, uh, then uh, Philippians, which we are currently studying, and then Colossians and Philemon. These are the four prison epistles, and we've studied uh, uh, two of the four in the process of studying the other two. So that's the story about Paul. And uh, Timothy, as I mentioned, in uh, these other epistles, he mentions him in First and sec uh, uh, in Second Corinthians one one. He mentions him in Colossians one one. He mentions him, of course, in Philemon one one, and then in First Thessalonians and in Second Thessalonians. In each of those, he mentions him as his colleague, as he does here, Paul and Timothy. And uh, uh, so I wanted to take a little time before we finish this verse and look at the uh, information about Timothy. Who was this guy, Timothy? Now, I haven't written a printed sheet of this. Perhaps if I have time, I'll uh, type one up and put it on the website. But uh, for right now, I'll simply go through. I have 14 points describing Timothy. And of course, Timothy got saved, as best we can tell, in Acts 16 and verse 1 uh, in Troas, where he was from. Uh, on the coast of Asia Minor, and Paul took him with, uh, Paul took him along when he went over into Macedonia, eventually getting up to north to Philippi, where he, of course, uh, found him or, or took him. And actually, after he left and went south to Corinth and some of the other locations in uh, Macedonia, he left Timothy apparently there to set up the local church. We noted the local church in Philippi probably included the Philippian jailer and his family and Lydia, the seller of purple dye and purple cloth uh, that, uh, uh, that he healed and therefore part of that local church that became a great church in the first century. So the 14 points go something like this. He was trained by his mother and his grandmother. We see this actually in Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.5 and 3.15. Apparently his mother and grandmother uh, were the ones who had the spiritual discernment and taught him the things of God. Uh, we know that his father apparently was a Greek. We hear nothing further. We don't know if he left uh, or just was not an influence uh, greatly. And so in a sense, I guess Paul uh, became a surrogate father to Timothy, and he kind of took him under his wing as he prepared him in the Pauline seminary, if we could call it that. So uh, Timothy was trained by his mother and his grandmother. Uh, that's in 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 3, 15. And so obviously he had a Hebrew upbringing. Uh, they were probably uh, Jews and they were teaching him the things of the Old Testament. Paul, of course, introduced him to the Lord and he didn't miss a step. He followed Paul 
uh, continuously throughout much of his ministry. Point number two, he possibly uh, 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 possibly living in Lystra when Paul made that first visit to that city. And so uh, uh, this is the second point. Uh, Lystra is where he, I believe, actually found him. Uh, point three, that's Acts 16.1. Uh, I think I'll go over there and clarify that just if you will. Acts, I think we looked at it in the last hour if you were here. Uh, here it says, And he came to Derby and to, uh, and to Lystra, and behold, certain disciple was there named Timothy. Uh, so yeah, he, got, he came to faith there. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So this is where he got saved and then continued on uh, to the coast to Troas. So he was already a believer, uh, but he went with Paul to Troas. And then they sailed from Troas over to the uh, Greek mainland and eventually up to Philippi. So uh, possibly living in Lystra when Paul, in his first visit to that city. Point three, he seems to have been converted at that time. Acts 14.6 and 2 Timothy 1.5. Acts 14.6 and uh, let's see, Acts 14. Take a look there. And uh, this is in about 45 AD. It says uh, they became aware. Uh, let's see, Paul was uh, ministering here in this area in Asia. And when they made an attempt, it was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, that is Paul. They became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconium, Lystra, and Derby, and the surrounding region. And at Lystra, there was a certain man without strength in his feet and uh, lame from his mother's womb who had never walked and listening to Paul when he spoke that uh, he apparently uh, was healed and his faith made him so under Paul's ministry. So apparently this is the time when Timothy got involved. Uh, we see it also referenced in 2 Timothy. So I might go over there just for a moment. 2 Timothy 1 5. 2 Timothy 1 5. Here he speaks about the fact that uh, as he is starting this, he talks about uh, that uh, he has here a longing to see you, even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere or genuine faith within you, which first dwelled in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is with you as well. So we have the fact that he is uh, writing to him now in terms of being a pastor. Apparently he's not with him at this time, but uh, writes this letter we call one of the three pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy, and then Titus, who was a pastor on a in a church or several churches that he ministered to on the island of Crete. All right. Um, point four: No mention of him again until Paul's second visit, but he was apparently under the care of the elders of local churches, as seen in Acts fourteen twenty-three. So apparently he was involved with several churches and several pastors, and uh, they were giving him additional instruction than the churches that Paul had worked with. Point five, God seems to have prophetically designated Timothy uh, as being fit for missionary work. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 1, 18. First Timothy 1, 18. He says here, uh, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son. We mentioned the fact that his father, Timothy's father, was a Greek. So in a sense, Paul considered him his spiritual father, and uh, therefore he calls him his son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. Apparently there were prophecies that were made that Timothy was going to minister and to become a pastor. Uh, that uh, by them you might fight the good fight, keep the faith of a good conscience, 
which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck uh, of in regard to their faith. And then he notes some of those who've been delivered over to Satan for the destruction of their blasphemy. All right, so we have this. And then again, he mentions it in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift. That would be the gift of pastor teacher as he's writing to Timothy within you which we, that is Paul and the other pastors, apparently they had a, an ordination ceremony of pastors, and they ordained him as a pastor, uh, bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. And this is, of course, the board of evaluation which recognized Timothy as a pastor. I think back to the days of my ordination in Houston in Baraka Church. I, I remember the laying on of hands of multiple deacons and uh, I hardly heard the prayer because uh, the floor was concrete and I was kneeling and in those days lifting weights my knees would be hurting and I remember all through the prayer I was telling the Lord please make this a short prayer <laughs> but uh, they did lay the hands on uh, I received ordination that is recognition after being examined by the pastor and the members of the board with regard to my ministerial and pastoral qualifications. And so likewise, this has been going on and should continue to go on through the dispensation of the church. I think of those men and women down in uh, Chafer Seminary who are preparing for ministry and particularly the pastorate as they are getting ready to go out and take uh, on local churches. I'm sure that they have ordination ceremonies to prepare these men for ministries. So it's nothing new. It's as old as the first century and the presbytery here, uh, those of course who uh, recognize Timothy and having the gift. Take pains with these things, that is, be absorbed in them, that is the study and the teaching of the word of God uh, so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself, that would be your own behavior, and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Persevere in good behavior and in the study and teaching. For as you do these things, you will uh, ensure deliverance both for yourself and those who hear you. The word salvation here uh, is pregnant. It would mean salvation for those unsaved who hear you and deliverance physically in the Christian life for those who are saved. And, of course, Timothy already being saved. So we have this training that uh, he has received, and now through prophetic utterance and the laying on of hands, the gift of pastor-teacher, and Paul recognizes it in these two sections in 1 Timothy 1.18 and 4.14. Point number six, Paul desired to have Timothy as a companion, uh, but there was a an issue, as we noted, in chapter 16 of Acts, verse 3, we mentioned in the last hour there, where there was the issue of circumcision. The Judaizers were, were pressing on Paul that uh, Timothy, having a Gentile father and a Jewish mother, apparently had not been circumcised. So they made a big issue of this, as the Judaizers were wont to do throughout the time that Paul traveled and ministered, trying to get the Christians to go back and fulfill all of the Mosaic law, which of course they couldn't do. There was no temple. The temple uh, uh, was uh, uh, destroyed in 70 AD. And of course, uh, uh, although they were still under that time frame, that uh, somehow they were going to go back and obey uh, the rituals of the Mosaic covenant. And Paul, of course, in the epistle to the Galatians, made it quite clear that we're under a higher law that is the law of Christ. However, at this time, Paul apparently was still a little young in ministry, and he succumbed to, uh, to have Timothy circumcised simply to appease these Hebrew people, these Jewish people, uh, so that uh, they could minister to them the gospel. He, I believe he later recanted of this, and in Galatians it talks about uh, these rituals that are not part of what we have as Christendom today. At any rate, uh, this was... Uh, uh, the fact that he had this circumcision performed in Acts 16, 3. Apparently, uh, the uh, was uncircumcised, as we noted, because his father was a Greek. Number seven, uh, I noted Paul later recanted this fact. We already mentioned it in Galatians 5, 6 through 14. And uh, uh, basically, you can't... Uh, uh, what do you call it, uncircumcised, a circumcised person. So uh, be that as it may. And even today, 
we see that in medical practice, uh, it is interesting that uh, young male children, I believe, are generally circumcised. I don't know if it's done on the eighth day. Biblically, that was the appropriate day when they had the highest antibodies to protect from infection. Uh, and it is certainly a, a ritual of cleanliness today. Uh, and I think most males have it, but it was the ritual uh, that was performed as a member of the body of the children of Abraham, where that was the sign of that particular covenant. Point eight, Timothy was set apart as an evangelist, as we noted, 1 Timothy 4.14, and also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. 2 Timothy Four, verse 5. Here it says, uh, let's see, we'll go back to verse 4. Oh, I'm in 1 Timothy. Right? 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Four, five. All right. Here again, he's writing this second epistle to Pastor Timothy, and he says, but you, <laughs> uh, and the previous verses, and as we begin chapter 4, he's talking about those who are in legalism and who are not teaching sound doctrine. In fact, in verse 4, he says, those who turn away from the truth. Boy, we have that in spades today. All the UFO watchers and the, uh, the evolutionists and all those people who believe in every kind of myth. And they accuse the Bible of being myth when it's truth. They accuse truth of being a myth and the things that they say are true are actually myths. At any rate, they turn away their ears from truth and they turn aside to myths. But you, Pastor Timothy, be sober. That means discipline, mental discipline in all things, enduring hardship, as often as the case with pastors, certainly in those days. Do the work of an evangelist. Now, he's a pastor, but he does the work of an evangelist. That is to say, every pastor teacher is responsible I believe in every class that he teaches to give the gospel clearly. It's one of those bones that I have uh, that I pick with the televangelists who uh, give a presentation as if they're talking to believers. And they're speaking to millions of people who perhaps just turned it on for a minute or two and they end up the message I believe they should give at the beginning, perhaps in the middle, and at the end of every message a televangelist gives, the gospel should be clearly presented. You have no idea who's listening. The gospel should be presented, even if you're a pastor in a, in a congregational setting with a local church, you act as an evangelist and give the gospel. I did the work of an evangelist before I had fulfilled the gift of pastor teacher. I traveled with Campus Crusade for Christ, Athletes in Action, for a number of years. Everywhere we went, we gave the gospel. But as a pastor teacher, I also am adjured by Paul here, as he tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Do not omit the presentation of the gospel while you are teaching doctrine to believers, because some may not really be believers, and some may have crept in who are unsaved. You never know, so you do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. To be a pastor teacher, part of fulfilling the ministry is to be an evangelist. And when you go out, you're not in the church setting, you're an evangelist. You're not a pastor teacher when you go to the market. You're an evangelist at any other time in your life. And that is part of fulfilling, as a minister and pastor, your ministry. For I am all ready being poured out as a drink offering. My time of departure is at hand. Paul signaling the fact that he's coming close to being martyred for his faith in the Lord. These are parting words to Timothy to be sober, to be diligent, and to also don't forget to do the work of an evangelist. Point nine, he became a constant companion, as we noted, of Paul and journeyed with him to Philippi. And we believe also that there was another individual uh, that is mentioned periodically, Silvanus. Possibly his name was Silas. That's the short name, kind of like Robert, Bob, you know, those names in English. We have uh, shorter <coughs> names for people, uh, John, Jack, and so forth. Uh, we have Silvanus and Silas. Uh, there may have been two individuals, or it may have been one. Certainly, they were with Paul on various journeys, as well as Luke. We have Luke mentioned in Acts 16, chapter 16, verse 12. So we have this 
Pauline traveling team of ministers, including uh, Timothy, including Silvanus or Silas or both, and uh, uh, Luke as well. And Luke was the great physician who traveled with Paul, particularly later in his ministry. He also stayed certain times in uh, cities where Paul had ministered and given the gospel just as Timothy had in Philippi, to continue and to strengthen the ministry. I think Paul liked to have him along <laughs> because he was a doctor. And so if any malady or a, a, a illness befell Paul, he had an on-hand 24-7 physician. Good idea. So that was where we find that in Acts 16, 12. Uh, so number 10, uh, his devotion to Paul and to the ministry is recorded in Philippians chapter 2:22. We're going to see it eventually, but let's just go over there for the moment in Philippians chapter 2 and 22. Here it says, uh, But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the forbearance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Again, Paul being, I believe, the surrogate spiritual father of Timothy, and he thought of him that way. Uh, I think he was just proud as pitch of Timothy and what he had become and the ministry that he would carry on after Paul's departure, Philippians 2.22. Number 11, he seems to have been left, as we noted behind in Philippi, to watch over the infant church there. And so uh, that's the, the surmise that we have. Point 12, he later appeared at uh, Berea, so apparently went on down to Berea, where he also remained with Silas after Paul's departure. Another time that Paul had ministered and traveled through, and then he would leave Luke or Silas or Timothy or a combination to pick up, as it were, the spiritual pieces and form the local church and give it the administrative base that it needed to continue. So we see this as the process of establishing local churches and having men on hand either as pastors in training, pastors or those who would administer until they could call a pastor teacher. It's an infinite church, uh, in, an infant church. Um, and so we see that uh, here as well. And point 13, Timothy traveled extensively with Paul and others as part of the Pauline team. Sometimes we like to call it the Pauline seminary. Paul expressed his desire to see him again in 2 Timothy 4, 9 and 21. Apparently Timothy had left uh, and was ministering elsewhere, and Paul was ag eager to see him again before he died. It is uncertain whether Timothy made it to Rome before Paul's execution. He was hoping he would. Apparently Luke was with him at the end, and he got the uh, epistles that uh, Luke wrote, perhaps even the Gospel uh, of Luke uh, that was uh, 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 written as well at that time. So we don't know whether he made it to Rome or not. However, he may well have been with Paul during that last imprisonment. Uh, we have some reference, as we noted, in Hebrews 13.23, that the writer of Hebrews was hoping that Timothy would come. So we're not sure if that's with Paul or where that is exactly, but Timothy is mentioned there in the book of Hebrews as being also a minister uh, under the training and assistance of of the writer of Hebrews. If it was Apollos, then it was with him. And finally, point number 14. According to tradition, Timothy continued as pastor teacher in a place called Ephesus. The study of the epistle we just finished, Pastor Timothy was the pastor of note that we believe was in Ephesus, and he finally suffered, as many of the apostles did, martyrdom under the uh, Caesar Domitian or perhaps Nerva, we're not certain of the which one it was. So that's our quick review of Timothy. And it's just to me interesting and important, I think, to note that these were real people. They had real difficulties and they ministered just as many of us have done as evangelists and traveled, being supported by people in various areas, starting up churches, continuing by leaving people there to minister. It's the same thing we do today. Uh, and it's just uh, the ministry goes on. And Paul told Timothy and Titus to train others so that they could train others, that they could train others. And this is the way that the ministry continues to this very day. And I believe will continue until the Lord's return.
six minutes. Okay, we're just uh, we're finished. So that brings us back, and we're finally uh, finished with the first two <laughs> first two words here. Uh, so we've been looking at Paul and Timothy, and then we noted the next word, of course, bond servants. The word bond servants, of course, is the word doulos. Uh, simply translated, it means slave or servant, a uh, bond servant, meaning sometimes in the first century someone who sold themselves into slavery to uh, compensate for debt that they had incurred, and they were considered a bond servant because they were sold out to a person who would be responsible for their needs, but also to serve that individual. In the same sense, Paul considered himself a slave or a doulos in the sense that he was a bond servant, the way it's translated here, uh, uh, because he recognized that he was under the servitude to Jesus Christ who would provide everything for him, and therefore he owed everything to Jesus Christ. And he included Timothy, Paul and Timothy, bond servants. The same phrase is used. This is what we call an appositional phrase, meaning that both Paul and Timothy were considering themselves to be bond servants. The same thing is found in Romans chapter 1 1 and also in Galatians 1 10, where he uses the term bond servants. And who are they bond servants of? The Lord Jesus Christ. What a great way to start. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. And then the address E, which is to the saints in Christ Jesus. Well, we know that these are believers because the word hagias refers to uh, sa saints, those who are set apart. And so the saints, the word for saints here, indicates that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is set apart unto God. So saints in Christ Jesus, uh, the New American Standard in the margin puts holy ones, which is fine, but holy ones could refer to angelic as well. Here it refers technically to human beings, therefore believers in Jesus Christ. The prepositional phrase and Christ Jesus, E-N, is in the sphere of, which indicates that when you believe in Jesus Christ, you're entered into union with Christ. And then, of course, he notes the fact that they are in Philippi, as well as the pastors or overseers, perhaps those who were in training, and the pastor, we noted, perhaps Epaphroditus, and to the deacons that were serving in that local church. Well, we'll pick it up there in verse 2 next time. Father God, thank you again for another opportunity to study your word and these passages and these individuals. Paul, that great uh, apostle and evangelist, and Timothy, a pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Uh, all of these individuals and many others, Luke, Silas, all of those that traveled and later, Prisca and Aquila, the whole cadre of people. I think there were probably in all 10 or 15 people who traveled with Paul and Timothy at various times through his four missionary journeys. And so we see that this was not just a sideshow, but a traveling evangelistic team to establish local churches and to present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that one person who may be here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you specifically in mind with all of us so that you might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave, that is, he chose, he called his only begotten son, his only born of a virgin, humanly speaking, son, that whosoever, that's anybody, that includes you, put your name in there, Anybody who believes in him, believes what? Believes that Jesus Christ is God, undiminished deity, second member of the Trinity, and true humanity of the virgin birth, and therefore true humanity, and he became qualified as a sinless human being to be that sacrifice. John called him the lamb without spot or blemish who takes away the sin of the world. And so he did. He took away your sin and my sin, the sin of Adam, the sin of every member of the human race, past, present, and future, once and for all time, once and for all sins, once and for all people. Right now, right where you sit, you can have everlasting life simply by believing in Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
It is written that, uh, that uh, if you believe in the name of the Son of God, you will have and know that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? You can form the words in your soul. I'm believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died on the cross for my sins and gives me eternal life. Right now I'm accepting that gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Thank you. And you can put it in the form of a prayer addressed to God the Father. That is the moment of your eternal salvation. Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to study these things together, to be edified of soul, to be encouraged by the humanity of Paul and Timothy and the Pauline team, that we follow their example and their theological understanding of who and what you are and your magnificent plan of salvation. To that end, we pray these things in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.